just drown out the noise, right? And drown out anybody trying to tell you that that's not a, the right career for you because it's an amazing career. Welcome to the Student Housing Insight Podcast, where we are putting you in touch with the people who bring student housing to life. I'm your host, Wesley Dees, and I'm also the owner of Providential Student Housing. Providential Student Housing is a consulting firm serving the student housing industry. We help investors, developers, and lenders with any due diligence needs they have when exploring a market or preparing for an acquisition. We also provide asset management services for a select group of clients. And last but not least, we also consult with companies who are looking to service the student housing industry with a product or service to basically make sure that product or service is truly meeting the needs of the industry. So if you are any of those groups and needing our help, please check us out at providentialstudenthousing.com. So before we jump into today's profile episode, I want to take a moment to thank this audience for all of the support that you've given Student Housing Insight and the platform. When I started this podcast almost six years ago, I never thought it would develop into what it has today and just all of the cool stuff we're doing. You know, many of you have sent me messages over the past several months recognizing all that we're doing and and how much value it brings you. Thank you so much for that. Those messages mean the world to me. Much of what SHI is, is just myself and Greta Dare. So when we get those messages, it makes it all worth it (laughs) when we know we are impacting what you guys are doing and hopefully making your life a little bit easier. All right, let's get into today's interview. This is another episode in our Profiles in Student Housing series. Each episode in this series includes myself sitting down with an industry leader and talking about their career journey, lessons learned, and what they see on the horizon regarding off-campus student housing. I really want to memorialize their contributions to the industry because this industry is still very young, and the folks who have made that journey from being a site level manager to now being in the C-suite or at an executive level, their contributions are found really throughout the industry because these are the people who took a sector of the real estate industry that no one wanted to deal with, college kids, and made it one of the most attractive and resilient sectors of real estate. And one of those companies that played a big part in that maturation of the sector is Price Company. Their founder, Donna Price, has been on the podcast before, and one of the first people I ever interviewed for the podcast was their chief acquisition and development officer, Susan Falkamer. If you've never heard those interviews, I'll make sure to link them in the show notes. But there's one guy at the Price Company who has not only witnessed their growth over the past 20 years, but his entire career from part-time turn help as a college student to chief operating officer, has been at the Price Company. And I'm talking about Adam Barley. If you've ever met Adam, well, you probably were looking up because he's like 6'9". And by the way, it was his height that got him his first job in student housing. He'll talk about that in this interview. But if you've met Adam, you immediately will figure out two things about him. It may be three. He's passionate about his Clemson Tigers, and he's passionate about student housing. He and I got to celebrate both of those passions back in 2019 when I hosted a student housing event at the 2019 College Football Championship game when Clemson just pounded Alabama. Living in South Carolina, I know how passionate Clemson fans are, but Adam, when you talk about people bleeding purple and orange, that's Adam. Several years ago, I would say his third passion was probably golf, but Adam recently became a father, and it's obvious that fatherhood is now at the top of his list. Adam is a little bit younger than me, and we've been running in the same circles for the past 20 years, which has really kind of given me the opportunity to see him grow in this industry. But when the pandemic hit and we were all freaking out on how we would respond to employees and residents... I saw Adam step up in a big way to not only lead the price company through the craziness, but he showcased that he was a real 
thought leader on how this industry was going to respond. So let's get into it. Here's my interview with Adam Barley of The Price Company. Adam, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Wes. I appreciate you inviting me on. I look forward to talking to you. We've had you on in the past, but it was from a standpoint of, I think it was last year's site level to C-suite webinar that we did, which we replayed on the podcast later. I've done a couple of those now, and it's cool talking to the folks that I've kind of come up with in this industry myself and seeing that uh, that venture from from being at the site level and going to the C-suite and getting some a little bit of the behind the scenes remarks from you on on what your journey was like. It just I couldn't wait to to get you on this episode where we're just talking all about Adam. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I have no problem. Anybody that knows me, I can generally talk about myself a decent amount. So I'm not usually one to do it, but I, I don't mind. Well, the one thing that that is certainly unique is you're probably one of the few folks out there that's got. Have you have you gone twenty years so far? I'm in my twentieth year as we speak. July twenty first will be my twentieth year, full twenty years with in the industry and all with the price company. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You, you're one of those unique folks that have uh, have been in for 20 years and all with one company. I don't know if there's anybody, I think there may be a couple people with Capstone that can stay, say that, yeah. um, but <laughs> it's, it's certainly a, a unique uh, experience in the business. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been fun to, to sort of grow up uh, in the industry, but also grow up with the company as it, as it, grew from its sort of small, humble beginnings uh, to where we are now. Yeah. And of course, Price Company is led by Donna Price, who we've had on the podcast before. And I guess she is the still the only female CEO in the in the business. Uh, to my knowledge. Yeah, that's right. From a that's right. 25 standpoint. That's right. Yeah, sure. Well, that that has certainly given you guys, you know, unique character. And I think Donna is just a, she's a huge leader within this industry and she's got a huge legacy that she's, you know, certainly going to leave behind when she does retire. I don't know that she ever will. Though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she certainly doesn't need to. She's uh she's a, a giant in this space and certainly the industry is, uh, is, is good to have her around and involved as much as possible because she, she's certainly an innovator. Well, hey, let, let's start with your origin story. You know, I, I know you went to school at Clemson. We'll get into that. But, you know, where did you grow up? How did that intersection with student housing happen? And tell us a little bit about the twists and turns that have happened during that journey. Sure. It was, I was born in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, all of my mom's side of the family's uh, South Carolinians. And so I grew up uh, though outside of Atlanta, the northeast suburbs of Atlanta, Gwinnett County, went to South Gwinnett High School. Okay. Uh, and in my high school, uh, everybody went to Georgia, right? Everybody went to UGA, mainly because of the Hope Scholarship. Uh, big, big reason to, to go to Georgia, you know, and at that time it was in its infancy. So going to Georgia was a cool thing. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to follow everybody that I went to high school with to go to UGA. And so I chose Clemson, which for those of you that don't know, I mean, Clemson is, is only about an hour and 40 minutes from where I grew up in Atlanta. It's only about 45 minutes from Athens. So um, they're very, very close by as they grew up you know, being big rivals. Yeah. Um, and then also I had the sort of in-state tuition piece, uh, as I could sort of claim residency in South Carolina from, from a lot of my mom's side of the family. So I went to Clemson, best university on the face of the earth. Uh, Go ahead and get my plug in for, for there. Um, It's uh, been good the past few years. That's for sure. Athletically, academically, I I joke with some of my fellow uh, alums that I don't think I would get in today if I had to reapply, but uh, thank God I don't have to. But anyway, I, uh, I went to Clemson, and that's sort of where my intersection with uh, student housing and the price company came to be. Uh, we 
Donna and Kirk did their first development outside of Raleigh, which is where our home base is. And it was in Clemson. Yeah. Uh, they had a piece of land about four and a half miles from the university, something you would never build today. But um, they built uh, some condos. So they uh, did condos when they were all the fad, you know, 2002 selling them to mom and dad so that, that their son or daughter could live in them or condos. Yeah, exactly. And in this case, selling them to uh, investors as well and then renting them out and growing their operating platform. And so in 2002, I met Kirk and Donna. I think they were at the housing fair in Clemson handing out pizza, basically saying, yeah, hey, we got this project. It's four and a half miles from campus, but don't worry. But anyway, um, I, I moved in as a, as a sophomore. Lived there for the first year ever the, the place was built. It was University Village in Clemson. And um, now, did you buy one of the units or? <laughs> no, no. I was just one of the renters uh, that um, gotcha. they were selling them gradually. But, you know, they, they still owned them that first year for the most part. Gotcha. And so lived in a unit. I, I tell you what, this is the best thing about it. my rent that first year was $250 a, a month a bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it really dates me. It, re- it was it really was a deal, right? This is not like one of those things where milk is you know ten cents a gallon and that kind of thing. But it was two hundred fifty dollars. Now it didn't include anything. This was back before there was furniture or utilities or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. But anyway, I, I needed a job, and um, they said, "Well, we don't really have anybody in the office. We don't have any need for you in the office, which is where I wanted to be." But they said, "We have turn coming up, and uh, you can you can." do that for a couple of weeks. We need somebody to help turn apartments and, and you're uh, a guy, so I'm sure you yeah, well, that's, that's actually funny. You guys are the maintenance supervisor said, uh, he said, you know, I want him to come with me because he can change light bulbs and smoke detector batteries without a ladder. And I don't have to carry the ladder around with me. <laughs> so, I joked that my height sort of got me in the business. Um, but move in day, somebody as just like we see in today's day and age, somebody quit during turn uh, and uh, they needed somebody in the office. So my first day was in on move-in day and kind of, Oh, wow. It was just a big fire hose coming at me, but um, it was pretty cool. And so I stayed on and the rest is history for me. Um, That was, like I said, July 21st, 2003 is when I started with the company. So that'd be 20, 20 years this July. Yeah. Yeah. For our our audience members who have not, Met Adam in person. You're what six five six six? I'm six eight actually. Six, eight. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I can believe that. Yeah. So you play basketball in high school? What? <laughs> I, I played sports throughout my my entire uh, career, I guess you could call it. But um, was never going to be good enough to go uh, pro or even Division One anything. So uh, it was it was definitely academics were definitely my my path uh, out of there. So, um, well, um, so yeah, tell us what, what happens next. I do want to mention to everybody what is, you know, so kind of crazy about this, this first property that you're on, cause it's still there today. It still operates as a, you know, a condominium has an HOA and, and all of that. And you guys are still, still managing it. Right. Yeah, we manage thirteen hundred out of the fifteen hundred beds still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what is such great training ground for a project like that for someone that eventually you know ends up becoming COO? You're dealing with what a couple hundred owners out of that whole thing. Yeah, that's right. Every every single deal there is like its own individual property. So uh, we're keeping track of. Uh, hours spent from maintenance teams to materials, you know, they, they use a, a battery or a, a nail or, or whatever. We're all doing individual accounting and individual, you know, financials for all of those individual unit owners. So I think right now there's 400 total units of which there's 325 different owners or so. And we manage those and we manage HOAs and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beast. There's only a few folks uh, in our business, in our shop, that still kind of understand it. It's one of those legacy assets that obviously we're not doing many of anymore. Um, and by many of, I mean 
zero, <laughs> but it, it's, it's a legacy asset that will always be with us for a long time. And, um, it's near and dear to my heart. And it's a, again, four and a half miles from campus, but now it's on the, on the shuttle route and there's stuff being built right next door. And, you know, J, JPI originally had a project right next door called Jefferson Commons, which is now the reserve, but it was like us and them for the longest time out sort of, I mean, it's in another town, right? It's not even in Clemson. But it's uh, pretty cool. It's a it's a cool place. But it was funny because we own we own three deals in Clemson, and they're in three different towns. We own in Central, and we own in Clemson, and we own in Seneca. Uh, so we have we have interesting the way that works with the way the the university's situated. So. Yeah. But I will say this before you go, it's it's really cool, a company that we started in Raleigh and our next market was Clemson. Those are our first two markets. And those two markets have been just unbelievable over the last 20 years. I mean, what a better place to sort of cut your teeth in student housing is in Raleigh and in Clemson, like just, just tremendous. So a little bit of it's fortuitous uh, for us in that, you know, the markets that we picked early on were good markets and we didn't have super huge challenges to overcome as a, as a small company at the time. Yeah. Yeah. ACC, I think has been good to us all. So, yeah, I mean, what, so you start on the maintenance side, kind of take us to the next step and. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing. I did everything. I literally started as a, a turn maintenance leasing, uh, both started part-time then full-time went to an assistant manager role I went to a property manager role all within that singular property at University Village in Clemson. And then after that, I moved into, uh, it was funny because at at the time, uh, sports marketing contracts were all the rage, right? Everybody was signing up with the university and doing all these fun things with you. But we, so we were on that train and we saw, we had a, sports marketing contract with Texas and Auburn and Clemson and NC State. And and we felt like nobody, the sites weren't really maximizing the contract. And so Donna said, hey, we need somebody to really go and make sure that we're optimizing all of our programming at all of these sites around our sports marketing contracts. I said, well, hell, I'll take that job. Yeah. Hey, that sounds like a great job. And so for for six months uh, or so, um, it was basically a go meet with your sports marketing rep and go to games and do parties and make sure all of your, your sites were doing fun parties and stuff. So I was like a a party planner for six months, which was awesome. But as you can imagine, that that job's probably was a a in the moment type position that after six months, I said, hey, you know, I don't think this is a full time gig necessarily. I don't think this is the best use of of my time. So it started as a, a regional. I was the very first regional for the price company. Moved into a, you know, I, I did every job for about three or four years, some shorter, some longer, but enough time to be able to sort of blaze the trail for those behind me. So being a regional, the first regional, I mean, it's not much different than a regional and other organizations today, but but it's the first regional for the price company. So we didn't really have uh, anybody to learn from within our organization. And so... Yeah. I did that for a while and then became um, sort of a a, a VP of leasing and programming throughout the entire portfolio. And ultimately, uh, through a few different VP levels, uh, made chief operating officer about six years ago now. Um, Almost maybe five, uh, December 2018. So, yeah, yes, almost almost five years total. So it's um, been a good run and a fun run. Definitely things that that I've learned with the company we've learned together some things we've we've built together and one of the things that I will say about me and and this company is that not only my tenure with the organization at 20 years is is pretty unique but my entire team that I have with me uh, on the leadership side is is tenured as well. I mean, Sarah Clark is our EVP of property management. She's been with us since 2005, and you know, I have I have a whole list of other folks. You know, our regional team 
the new guy is 12 years in with the company. <laughs> so that's like the newbie. He's the rookie, you know? And so you're just like, wow, this is, um, it's an incredible run, incredible tenure. You just don't really see across organizations. It, it's fun. A couple of things I want to unpack there. So going back to, to Clemson, what was your, what was your major in? Um, I was a political science major uh, with a minor in history with every intention to go to law school, every intention. And I started working for a company and my mom said, wait a minute, I, I paid for your school so that you could be in property management, right? And and that, my mom's reaction is still an uphill battle that we fight today, right? It's like, this is a real career. It is a real industry. And, and moms and dads are like, wait, wait, what are you doing? You know, but it, it, stop doing that college thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I loved it. I was, I still feel young because I, I continue to be around colleges and universities. And, but yeah, I had every intention of being a lawyer. Started with this property management thing and uh, it took a little bit, but I took a year off thinking I'd go back and do everything. And just, I said, no, I'm done. I think I'm done. I, I, I like, I like working. I like, uh, I don't love, I love school. Trust me. I, I love school more than anybody, but I didn't love to have to do school. So that's sort of my, my genesis there. So much like everybody else in this business that went to school for something else, right? Very few of us went to school for property management, although it is, uh, you see more and more of that, right? Different school offerings, uh, having property management or commercial real estate, uh, you know, hospitality. Exactly. Exactly. You know, what's kind of amazing about that, because there's some similar paths between your background and my background. And, and what's really cool about that is I think, I think when you became a regional, you were actually over the property that I started at at UNC Charlotte, which at the time was University Townhomes. You guys renamed it. What was it? 49? 49 North. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 49 North. So a lot of, a lot of memories there, but kind of the um, same thing. You know, I was, I was a history major. I was going to go into teaching. I was finishing up my teaching clinicals and had realized, no, nah, I don't want to teach. And it was the same thing. I was I had a Western Civ prof- professor that said I should consider law school, and so started doing that while I was working as an assistant manager. And yeah, I just decided I had enough of school, and the property management thing was, yeah, was keeping me busy. So just kind of kept with it. But you know, to go back really quick, tell us a little bit about that whole process of you know you're the first regional. I was the same. Same way with the first company I was with in this. And it was the same thing. Like they had a lot of experience doing the kitty condo thing, but there was no policy and procedure manual for operating apartments. So Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how that process was, you know, having to, I'm sure probably every time something new kind of comes up, you got to stop and think about it and say, okay, as a company, what are we going to do here? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You know, we didn't, you know, the saying, you don't know what you don't know. That was very true for us. I mean, you, back in those early days, we were focused on just finding enough kids to lease our beds, right? And and all of these these sort of items, you know, the issues that maybe we deal with now that are in our, our peripheral vision, they weren't even on our radar back then. And so, it was one of the things where you're right, you would sort of manage by exception a little bit or, or and you take a an issue that came up and say, oh, well, we need a policy around this. We're still a very early mom and pop uh, startup almost. We had good property management background, but student housing was just an evolving yeah. beast, right? And, and, and nobody, even I, I remember never forget um, getting my hands on an EDR operating manual, right? And I was just like, I mean, I was a re, I was maybe my first year as a regional. I was still a property manager. And EDR as a as a company that the price company had always viewed as our shining star, right? Like you know, we were like, if what EDR? They're a great organization. We loved Randy and Chris and everybody that was at EDR. And we said, okay. And so we looked at this EDR manual, and we were like. 
there is no, it was going to take us a decade, right? Which it took them probably too to create this. And so there was a point where we said, well, I don't know if we can manage by flipping to page 42 and looking at item, you know, see like it. But as you grow and larger with an organization, you realize that that policy manual wasn't necessarily there for the property manager to go figure out, right? It's more of a, this is how we're going to do business and we're going to sort of codify it in writing. And we're going to make a point as this is our policies on certain items. And so as we've grown, you just, have to figure out what's important, right? And we're right now blessed with some of the best fundamentals that we've ever had in student housing. And I joke with my team, I say, you know, remember when we'd come in every day and we'd worry about leasing, you know, we'd worry about how we were going to fill beds. And like, I mean, it's still obviously a concern. We, we want to, you know, that's, that's obviously the name of the game is growing revenue and reducing expenses and increasing NOI. But so many things now play into that. It was usually what what publication are you uh, or what what flyer are you going to make today to go <laughs> on campus and hand out to people, you know? Um, and thankfully, universities cracked down on that because I think that was probably the worst job that anybody could have was going out and you know the co- famous comedian said he's like the people giving out flyers is to say. Here, you throw this away, you know. That kind of thing. So, uh, but it's uh, it's evolved. Um, the company has evolved. The industry has evolved, and we've been blessed, really, to be sort of at the forefront of the industry as it started. But then also back to what your comments about Donna. I mean, Donna has always been an innovator in the space, and so we've always felt blessed to know that we had someone leading our organization that was sort of a trendsetter or that was, uh, and and some of the ideas work, some don't, you know, but you just keep working at it and you just keep doing it. And um, that's how the price company really has, has grown to where we are today. Yeah. Speaking of the flyers, uh, you remember the ones that at the bottom portion of it, we put the telephone numbers on it, you know, vertically and then cut it. So they could just <laughs> I do. Remember the thing called phones when people called you, you know, <laughs> we're having one in the back. <laughs> you know, uh, told, do not open it. Yeah. It's a complete emergency. <laughs> I have, a, I have a funny story. This will show our sort of, um, infancy in the space. This was probably 2005 and we had a great a site, uh, marketing manager that, we did this flyer and it was like uh, the property name and it had a picture of Chuck Norris on the front. It was like, sign with wherever or get a, this is back when Chuck Norris jokes were all their age, right? And it's like, or get a roundhouse kick to the face or something. It was just, it was funny, but it was, people really liked it. It was, we actually got stuff, you know, out of it. And uh, we got a letter from Chuck Norris's attorney saying, uh, uh, you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, and we are like, oh, we, we've made it, you know, we've made it. We got an attorney letter from Chuck Norris. So uh, it was, uh, it was, you know, a very, very brief campaign, uh, but it was, uh, it was fun to think about at the time and that we would never, ever contemplate doing today. So uh, I feel like you kind of created the first meme there with. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Hey, look, you and I both, you know, I've seen this evolution of what the, you know, modern student housing, purpose-built student housing at least looks like. I want to spend a little bit of time with you kind of talking about the future. I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges you see facing the industry in the, in the years to come? Well, it's a great question. It's kind of a loaded question. I mean, I do think fundamentals are great right now. There's a lot of studies and, and demographic numbers that show that we're maybe not looking at such great fundamentals in three to five years from now. Less less kids in, in high school classrooms uh, in 2026 than you know, the lowest numbers at that time than they'll ever have been in the 20 years prior. And so uh, fundamentals will continue to hopefully stay strong through that period. Uh, there's some things that you can augment lack of domestic students by, uh, you know, in migration from, from international students that could potentially help solve any gap. 
But what you're really going to see, I think, is where in secondary and, and maybe tertiary universities where we're going to sort of struggle with filling, you know, having enough demand to fill fill our beds. And so I don't think there's ever any concern about any primary state institution filling its supply yeah. because they just tweak their number just tiny bit and uh, they get the number of, of students that they need. But that trickle down effect will have some some challenges in the secondary universities in the next five to six years, I think. I also think we face a, a challenge as an industry in that are the operators equipped to serve and, and ha- wear as many hats as they'll need to serve their, their tenant base, right? And to serve their tenants. You know, we joked 10 years ago that we weren't just property managers, but that we were cruise directors and, you know, uh, referees. But now, you know, that's become basically, you know, another form of parent or psychologist or, or uh, doctor. I mean, you know, we, we wear so many hats now uh, and our tenant base is, is so different. You know, an 18 year old today deals with so many different challenges that an 18 year old dealt with 20 years ago. And is the industry equipped, are operators equipped to be able to manage through that and manage, you know, serve our tenants the best way possible? Because they are, they're going to need more from us. And so I do think that's a challenge. I think the industry, um, ACC, us along with uh, Cardinal, a lot of these other groups have joined together to do the mental health awareness with the Hi, How Are You project. I'll I'll plug that. That's a great step, right? I mean, I think to recognize what student housing operators can do for their students when it comes to mental health is tremendous. You know, resident life programming here at Price, you know, we have a coach, what we call coach uh, program that has five pillars of resident life. That's not just about parties, right? Everybody can do a pool party, but can you provide core life skills? Can you provide culture and diversity items? Can you provide a health, safety, environment, those types of things to your students that that ultimately they need? And so I do believe that is a challenge that faces our business. It's going to really allow the, the, the cream of the crop of operators to rise because I, I don't think that there are some, this, is, this job is not for the squeamish, right? I think it's hard. It's fun, but it's very, very hard. It's very management and labor intensive and, and it's certainly going to need some, some top operators to rise to meet the challenges of today's student. What, what do you feel like is from a personnel standpoint right now, the hardest thing that there is to, to fill with a good candidate and then maybe what are you guys doing to try to cultivate that on your own? Cause you guys have done a great job of cultivating leaders within, within your company. So just kind of wondering what's the biggest challenge from a personnel standpoint right now? Yeah, we have, um, you know, we've sort of had a hard and fast rule that we don't, we don't make an outside hire without exhausting all of our options internally first. Right. And so most of the, I'll call them office jobs, property manager, assistant property manager, leasing manager, whatever you want to call. We have a really good track record of filling those internally with somebody coming up from part time or moving from another site where we don't have that great of a track record. There is in maintenance. And I think that everybody probably that's listening to this shares a similar uh, feeling that, that that job, those maintenance and facilities positions are the hardest for us to fill. It's a tough job. It, it requires on call. And so we've really had to get creative with how we compensate and how we your know, understanding of on call needs, not only from the tenant side, but also from our employee side. So I think that's probably the biggest sector of our personnel groupings that, that needs the most attention. I still, uh, to this day, don't believe we, we pay enough in that side of, of the business. We're all constrained on uh, on payroll. Uh, we're all constrained with by what our budgets and our underwriting our performers uh, give us. But but that is one area where I think that we all can do better 
in this business by recognizing some of the gaps that we have in facilities and maintenance, for sure. Those are some of the, the most important jobs on any site. Oh, yeah. You know it better than, than anybody, too. I mean, it's just it's, it's hard to fill. But when you find somebody, you just got to hold on to them and do whatever you can to hold on to them because they are invaluable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of expand on that a little bit. The The majority of the Student Housing Insight audience is, you know, majority site level managers. And, you know, a lot of them come up to me in conferences or send me direct messages saying, hey, I've been doing this for three, four or five years since graduating college. I'm kind of at that point where I don't know if I want to continue with this or make it a longer career. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's kind of your, you know, advice that you would give to to those folks and especially if they're wanting to get to the next level? Well, I would start with those that are maybe part time and they're thinking about whether or not they want to stay in the business to begin with. And I'll go back to what I said at the beginning is to say drown out the noise for those people that are trying to tell you that property management is not a, a viable career. Right. I mean, that is completely as far from the truth as you can possibly get. So for those folks, I would say I got a, I got a feeling you don't let your mom on site. Yeah, right? no, she loves it now. She's a subscriber to student housing business. She's, you know, she reads my articles and all kinds of stuff. So she loves it now. But um, but but yeah, just drown out the noise. Right. And drown out anybody trying to tell you that that's not a, the right career for you because it's an amazing career. And it's an amazing career path that can take you in so many different places, right? It, it, property management can lead to a whole host of different real estate careers, whether that be in new business or whether that be on the, the prop tech side or, or vendor side or, or supplier. So whatever it may be, there are so many uh, opportunities within this business. Second, for those of, that are been, like you said, coming up to you, I've been doing this for a while. What's my next step? My advice is to move, move to a different city, to a different property, to a different uh, university. Uh, the more you can build your resume with different markets is makes you that much more attractive to any other you know, company out there. Some people don't have that luxury. But if you do, if you are you know, single or you're, you have the ability, you have nothing tying you down, even if it's a market that you think is horrible or you think is, I don't want to move to uh, whatever state. I won't, I won't throw any other states under the bus here, but, um, but do it because it builds so much character. It builds so much uh, of your ability to see different sides of the business because what works in Orlando doesn't work in Austin, doesn't work in Athens. And those are all places where people are needed. You, you, you can go look on job boards if you're looking to move to another company. I, I personally am a, a very big fan. If you like the place that you, you like the culture and you like the company, you may not like your position. Just go move. Do something different. Take a lateral move, right? But do something different because you always got to keep keep your mind moving, keep your feet moving, because the more you kind of get sunk into a general role that you feel like you've just done and, you know, you've perfected, you'll start to lose passion and you'll start to lose uh, ability. You'll start to lose a, that, you know, sort of thirst for knowledge uh, in this business. And, and so my, my suggestion to anybody is just move to a new place. All of the people that we have on our leadership team on the property management side have all been three, four, five different markets. And um, it gives you a perspective that is invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Great advice. So what's on the horizon for, for price and, and yourself? I know you and your wife have a, a pretty young child at home and some things have changed for you, you know, personally from that standpoint, but sure. anything else on the, on the uh, horizon? Um, we have a four-year-old son, as you mentioned. So we're starting kindergarten next year, which is exciting. But uh, uh, I think um, we're done with children. <laughs> we, one was enough for me. Um, he's my pride and joy, but 
certainly am ready. Um, he's given me everything that I can possibly ever want in, in children. But but no, um, uh, for, for us, uh, me personally, uh, obviously my goal is to build you know, continue building uh, this organization to new levels. You know, we, we never set out to be the biggest company in student housing. We don't want to be the most beds under management. We want to continue to retain our really unique culture, our really unique tenure that we have with this team. And, and we do want to grow. Growth is very important to us. We just we don't necessarily have to be at a hundred thousand beds to, to feel accomplished. So we've had tremendous transactional activity over the past two years. I think we've done all of a billion in each year in transactional activity, but a lot of that is also transaction dispositions too. So our bed count has hovered somewhere around 30 to 32,000. Uh, we'd like to be at 40,000 by the end of this year. We're already on our way. We're going to take 3,800 beds or so for the first three months of this year. So that's really exciting. And uh, we're, we're looking you know, more towards uh, the future of both third-party management. Acquisitions continue to be a big, big thing for us. Our portfolio is about 65% uh, owned and 35% or so third-party uh, fee managed. Uh, so we like that, that ratio. That's a good ratio for us. We've launched... Um, uh, Iris Technologies, which is sort of a new initiative for us on the technology uh, side, consulting and, and uh, internet negotiation and any sort of prop tech uh, for those operators, both on the conventional side and in student housing that maybe don't really want to have you know an internal group to do that. Um, so we're going out, we're going out and launching that business this year, which is great. We're excited about that. Any kind of smart tech or, or smart home technology access controls, those types of things. We have about 50, 60 years of experience of folks in our shop that have done that. So uh, start, you know, sort of that consulting gig on that side. So that that's exciting. And, uh, you know, I think just just continue to grow and, and grow to a point where we're comfortable, but but uncomfortable at the same time. You know, if you're, if you're comfortable all the time, it probably means you're not trying hard enough. Right. Um, so kind of our path through forward through the next 20, you know, 2023 and the next 12 months, it'll be interesting to see how capital markets rebound, what the fed does with, with rates and if buyers and sellers can bridge the gap between uh, asking prices and and potentially start getting uh, some some transactions back on the board for for the last half of this year. Gotcha. Well, getting back to to the technology thing, you said you're calling it Iris. Is that Iris? Yeah, Iris Technologies. Just to expand on that a little bit. Is that from the way you described it? I kind of took it as maybe if I'm a developer or maybe if I've just got ten, twelve student condos in in Charlotte, and I just want to maximize the efficiency with whatever technology be it you know smart locks or right. contract with spectrum or whatever is that just something that is complete turnkey that i would turn over to you guys? exactly right yeah i mean you basically say i don't want to deal with this i'm just going to hire a group that can handle all of this for me and that's that's our group i mean we will we will negotiate your internet bulk internet contracts uh we will uh deploy Get, sort of give you a good, better, best option with uh, strategic partners on access controls, uh, audio, video, you know, uh, smart home, any kind of prop tech that there is. Uh, our group knows about it. Our group has demoed it. Our group has, you know, been able to weed out uh, yeah. a lot of the folks that, 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 you know, aren't necessarily the best for student housing or best for multifamily. And we, you know, literally soup to nuts for, for everything prop tech, our group can do it. And um, again, it is for that, that it generally that smaller operator or that operator that really just says, I don't want to spend money on infrastructure and payroll to have somebody do this in house. I'll just have somebody else go out and do it for us. And, and we're, we'd love to be that group. Gotcha. Gotcha. That is definitely interesting. I'm, I'm assuming the strategic hire of, of Whitney Kidd may have played a little bit into that. Yeah, we did. We brought Whitney on to uh, to run that business for us. Um, she's a, an industry uh, veteran of on-site and real page and, and 
has a, a long, long list of, of prop tech ventures. So we're excited for her to, uh, to be the face of that business for us. So fantastic. Well, any final words of wisdom, Adam, that you want to share with our audience? Um, you know, I, I've never, I'm not a, I'm not a big quote guy. Um, I, I, I generally, I hate to say it, but I, I was listening to Nick Saban, who's like our arch enemy at Clemson. You know, he beat us a couple times, and we beat him a couple times. So uh, we, we got a little bit on him. But anyway, he was addressing a crowd, and I'll, I'll kind of give this for all back to the all the audience members that are, are sort of site-level folks. And he, he said, you know, he what he looks for in players are to be an and and not a but, Right. He searches out and seeks out guys uh, on his team that that you can say he's a unbelievable receiver and he's a wonderful uh, man in the community. Yeah. Uh, or as opposed to a, somebody that says, well, he can throw it a uh, country mile, but he's a real toxic in the locker room. And so I try to tell all my folks to be ands and not buts. Uh, I, I thought it was really easy to, to understand. Be accretive to your organization be willing to go that extra mile and uh, just, just, you know, I, I always love to see people innovate in our space and, and share in our space in terms of operational ideas. Uh, we have such a tight knit industry and I would hate to ever see that go away because we do like to, uh, you know, we do sort of lean on the shoulders of others in our business when it comes to operations because we are, such a, a new industry, really, for lack of, you know, I mean, it, it is new. I mean, it's, I mean, you can say however old it is, but really, it's it's really evolved in the last 10 years. So, well, and, it, you know, I want to just give you a, a personal note of appreciation for the way that both yourself and the company have really, um, you know, stood up through COVID and or stepped things up, you know, through COVID and, and been a real leader through the, um, for the entire industry from, from that standpoint. And of course, out of that came shop talk and, you know, you're one of the six members of our leadership committee for, for that. And appreciate you volunteering your time for that. You're, I, I always, I, I want to make sure that you're on as many of those calls as possible as far as our leadership calls, because we'll come up with kind of a half ass idea of something. We to do. <laughs> and you're the guy that's like, you know what? If we're gonna do this, <laughs> and it's, uh, and that that really amps things up a little bit. And I really appreciate appreciate your time. And uh, well, you're you're quite welcome. I love I love being a part of it. I love what you're doing in the space. You've really stepped up to fill a void, and we're all better for it in this business. So thank you very much for for everything you do. A lot of times, it's a thankless job. I think for for you a little bit, but I want to say thank you on behalf of our organization to everything that you provide to us as, as a business. So. Uh, absolutely. I, I am uh, enjoying every moment of it. So, well, thanks so much, Adam, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, again, thanks so much to Adam for his time and providing his insight. I can't wait to see what the next 20 years has in store for him. Well, folks, that does it for this episode. I do want to remind everyone to join us for the industry's monthly webinar called Shop Talk. And I say it's the industry's monthly webinar because while Student Housing Insight produces it, it is led by a six-member uh, leadership committee with veterans like Adam who are guiding these discussions. And it's not a sponsored webinar with someone who's you know trying to sell you something. Rather, it's, it's just a monthly huddle across the entire industry to talk about topics that are currently impacting the student housing industry. So, so go to shoptalk.info. Again, that's shoptalk.info. And register to receive uh, the calendar invites so that you are aware of when those are happening. It's typically the second Thursday of every month, but sometimes we have to deviate from that. So 
make sure that you go there and register. You can also view previous Shop Talk meetings on that website, or you can view them at our YouTube channel, specifically at Student Housing Insights YouTube channel. Um, so go check that out. Make sure that you subscribe there. Last but not least, if we've brought you any value in this podcast today, please make sure you share it with your colleagues and make sure that you follow us on LinkedIn. I'll put all of those links in the show notes. Everyone take care and we'll talk to you soon.